John Wayne Gacy was convicted of the torture, rape and murder of 33 males between 1972 until his arrest in 1978. He was dubbed the killer clown because he entertained children at parties and hospitals as Pogo the clown. On May 10, 1994, Gacy was executed by lethal injection. John Gacy was born on March 17, 1942 in Chicago, Illinois. He was the second of 3 children and the only son born to John Stanley Gacy and Marion Robinson. From age 4, Gacy was verbally and physically abused by his alcoholic father. Despite the abuse, Gacy admired his father and constantly sought his approval. In return, his father would hurl insults at him, telling him he was stupid and acted like a girl. When Gacy was 7 years old, he was molested repeatedly by a friend of the family. He never told his parents about it. fearing that his father would find him at fault and he would be severely punished when gacy was in elementary school he was diagnosed with the congenital heart condition which limited his physical activity as a result he became overweight and endured teasing from his classmates Gacy found it too difficult to catch up with what he had missed in school while hospitalized so he decided to drop out His being a high school dropout solidified his father's constant accusations that Gacy was stupid Gacy's years of abuse from his father finally wore him down After several episodes of his father having refused to let Gacy use his own car, he had enough. He packed his belongings and escaped to Las Vegas, Nevada. In Las Vegas, Gacy worked for an ambulance service for a short time, but was then transferred to a mortuary where he was employed as an attendant. He often spent nights alone at the mortuary. where he would sleep on a cot near the embalming room on the last night that gacy worked there he got into a coffin and found till the corpse of a teenage boy afterward he was so confused and shocked by the realization that he had been sexually aroused by a male corpse that he called his mother the following day and without providing details asked if he could return home His father agreed and Gacy who had only been gone for 90 days quit his job at the mortuary and drove back to Chicago. Gacy got married to Marilyn in September 1964 and then moved to Waterloo when the Gacy managed three Kentucky fried chicken restaurants owned by Marilyn's father. The newlyweds moved into Marilyn's parents' home rent-free. Gacy soon joined the Waterloo Jaycees and once again quickly moved up the ranks. In 1967, he received recognition as outstanding vice president of the Waterloo Jaycees and earned a seat on the board of directors. But unlike in Springfield, The Waterloo Jaycees had a dark side that involved illegal drug use, wife swap- swapping, prostitutes, and pornography. Gacy slid right into the position of managing and regularly participating in these activities. Gacy also began to act on his desires to have sex with male teenagers, many of whom worked at the fried chicken restaurants he managed. He turned a basement room into a hangout as a way to attract teens. He would entice the boys with free alcohol and pornography. Gacy would then take sexual advantage of some of the boys after they became too intoxicated to put up any resistance. 
while Gacy was molesting teens in his basement and doing drugs with the JC pals, Marilyn was busy having children. The first child was a boy, born in 1967, and the second child was a girl, born a year later. Gacy later described this time of his life as being nearly perfect. It was also the only time he finally gained any approval from his father. A common trait shared by many serial killers is their belief that they are smarter than everyone and they will never get caught. Gacy fit that profile. With his above average earnings and his social connections through the JCs, Gacy's ego and confidence level grew. He became pushy and commanding and would often brag about accomplishments, most of which were transparent lies. The JC members who were not into hookers and porn began putting a distance between themselves and Gacy or the Colonel, as he insisted on being called. But in March 1968, Gacy's near perfect world quickly fell apart. In August 1967, Gacy had hired 15 year old Donald Voheats to do odd jobs around his house. Donald met Gacy through his father, who was also in the Gracies. After finishing his work, Gacy lured the teen to his basement with the promise of free, free beer and porn movies. After Gacy supplied him with an ample abundance of alcohol, he forced him into having oral sex. This experience seemed to unplug any fears Gacy had about getting caught. Over the next several months, he sexually abused several teenage boys. He convinced some of them that a scientific research program that he was involved in was looking for participants and they would be paid $1.50 for each session. He also used blackmail as a way to force them into sexual submission. But in March 1968, it all came crashing down to Gacy. Voorhees told his father about the incident with Gacy in his basement, who immediately reported it to the police. Another 16-year-old victim also reported Gacy to the police. Gacy was arrested and charged with oral sodomy of 15-year-old and attempted assault of the other boy charges he strongly denied. Gacy pled guilty to sodomy and received a 10-year sentence. Gacy did everything right in prison. He earned his high school degree and took his position as head cook seriously. His good behavior paid off. In October 1971, after completing just two years of his sentence, he was released and placed on probation for 12 months. With nothing to return to in Waterloo, Gacy moved back to Chicago to begin rebuilding his life. He moved in with his mother and got a job working as a cook and then worked for a construction contractor. On Jan 2, 1972, Timothy Jack McCoy, age 16, was planning on sleeping at bus terminal in Chicago. His next bus wasn't scheduled until the following day, but when Gacy approached him and offered to give him a tour of the city, plus let him sleep at his house, McCoy took him up on it. According to Gacy's account, he awoke the following morning and saw McCoy standing with a knife at his bedroom door. Gacy thought the teen intended on killing him, so he charged the boy and got control of the knife. Gacy then stabbed the teen to death. Afterward, he realized that he had mistaken McCoy's intentions. The teen had a knife because he was preparing breakfast and had gone to Gacy's room to wake him up. Although Gacy had not planned to kill McCoy when he brought him home, he couldn't dismiss the fact that he had become sexually aroused to the point of orgasm during the kill. In fact, the killing was the most intense sexual pleasure he had ever felt. Timothy Jack McCoy was the first of many to be buried in the crawl space under the Gacy's home. 
Gacy was taken into custody knowing that his game was up. He confessed to murdering Robert Pierce. He also confessed to 32 additional murders starting in 1974 and hinted that the total could be a high as of 45 during the confession gacy explained how he had restrained his victims by pretending to do a magic trick which required that they put on handcuffs he then stuffed socks or underwear into their mouths and used a bolt with chains which he would place under their chest when wrapped the chains around their neck he would then choke them to death while raping them through dental and radiology records 25 of the 33 bodies found were identified in an effort to identify the remaining unknown victims dna testing was performed from 2011 to 2016 gacy went on trial on february 6 1980 for the murder of the 33 young men His defense lawyers tried to prove that Gacy was insane, but the jury of five women and seven men did not agree. After only two hours of deliberation, the jury returned a verdict of guilty and Gacy was given the death penalty. While on death row, Gacy continued to taunt authorities with different versions of his story about the murders in an attempt to stay alive. But once his appeals were exhausted, the execution date was set. John Gacy was executed by lethal injection on May 9, 1994. His last words were, kiss my ass.